The BBC presents The Sign of Four, a Sherlock Holmes story by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, adapted as a serial for radio in five episodes by Felix Felton. The story is told as usual by Sherlock Holmes' friend and assistant, Dr. Watson. Episode two, The Tragedy of Pondicherry Lock. day to you. When the beautiful Miss Mary Morstan called at our Baker Street rooms one September afternoon in 1888, she brought us a curious story. How her father, on leave from India, had disappeared from a London hotel ten years ago and never been seen again. How, following the death four years later of her father's friend, Major Sholto, she had been sent a valuable pearl on the same day every year and how on the morning of her visit to us she had received a mysterious request to be outside the Lyceum Theatre at seven o'clock that evening with two friends. Sherlock Holmes and I had accompanied her, and a four-wheeler had whisked us across the river and through the dingy South London streets until we had come to a commonplace little house in a new terrace. There the door had been opened by a tall Hindu servant. Miss Marston... I am, Miss Morstan, and these are my friends. The Saab awaits you. I will warn him of your arrival. You follow me, please? The Indian led us down a narrow, somewhat dingy passage until he came to a door which he threw open and motioned us in. The room was as out of place as a diamond in a setting of brass. Rich curtains and tapestries draped the walls. The carpet was of amber and black with great tiger skins thrown across it. A huge hookah stood on a mat, filling the room with a subtle aromatic odor. And standing amidst this eastern luxury was a small man with a high, bald head, fringed with a bristle of red hair, whose hands and features were in a perpetual jerk. Your servant, Miss Boston. Your servant, gentlemen. Pray step into my little sanctum. Thank you. A small place, but furnished to my own liking. An oasis of art in the howling desert of South London. <laughs> May we ask whom we have the honor of addressing? Mr. Thaddeus Sholto, that is my name. You are Miss Morstan, of course. Yes. And uh, these gentlemen... This is Mr. Sherlock Holmes, and this is Dr. Watson. Oh, a doctor, eh? Oh, have, have you your stethoscope with you, sir? Yes, never without it. But well, might I ask, then... Um, would you have the kindness... Uh, um, what is it? Well, I, I have grave doubts as to my mitral valve. It would be so very good. The aortic I can rely on, but I should value your opinion on the mitral. Oh, well, certainly, if you wish it. Uh, will you excuse us, Miss Morstan? Certainly. Uh, just come over here, sir. Thank you. Well, now, open your shirt, please. That's it. Now breathe. Again. Hmm. Appears to be quite normal. Oh. I don't think you have any cause for uneasiness. Oh, thank you. You'll excuse my anxiety, Miss Morstan. I, I'm a great sufferer, and I've long had suspicions of that valve. I'm delighted to hear that they're unwarranted. Had your father, Miss Morstan, refrained from throwing a strain on his heart, he might have been alive now. Really, sir? What a callous thing to say in front of his own daughter. Have you no feelings? Doctor, please. It doesn't matter. I knew in my heart he was dead. <sighs> I can tell you just what happened. And what is more, I can do you justice. And I will, too. Whatever Brother Bartholomew may say. Brother Bartholomew? My twin. Oh. Miss Morstan, I'm so glad to have your friends here. Not, not only as an escort to you, but also as witnesses to what I'm about to do and say. The three of us can show a bold front to Brother Bartholomew. But uh, let us have no outsiders. No police or officials. Nothing would annoy Brother Bartholomew more than any publicity. For my part, whatever you choose to say will go no further. I say the same. Oh, that's well, that's well. Now, may I offer you a glass of Chianti, Miss Morstan, or um, of Tokai? I keep no other wine. Not for me. The gentleman? No, no, no thank, thank you. you. Well, then, I trust you have no objection to the odour of Eastern tobacco. I, I am a little nervous, and I find my hookah an invaluable sedative. <laughs> Forgive me. Mm. 
now. When I first decided to communicate with you, Miss Morstan, I might have given you my address. Why didn't you? Well, I was afraid you would disregard my request and bring unpleasant people with you. So I took the liberty of arranging the appointment in such a way that my man Williams could see you first. <laughs> you, you will excuse these precautions, but I am a man of retiring, I might even say refined tastes, and there is nothing more unesthetic than a policeman. Do you like my treasures? That landscape is a genuine coro. Uh, a connoisseur might perhaps throw doubt on that Salvador Rosa, but there can be no doubt about the Bouguero. And as for Mr. the... Mr. Sholto. Yes, yes. You will excuse me, but I'm here at your request to learn something that you wish to tell me. It's getting late. Yes. Well, I'm afraid it's bound to take a little time. You see, we shall have to go to Norwood. Norwood? Why? To meet Brother Bartholomew, of course. Your twin? Yes. We must see if we can get the better of him. He's very angry with me for what I've done. I had quite high words with him last night. <laughs> you can't imagine what a terrible fellow he is when he's angry. If we've got to go to Norwood, perhaps it'd be as well if we started at once. Oh, no. Oh, dear me. No, no, no. <laughs> that wouldn't do at all. No. I, I must prepare you by showing you how we all stand to each other. There are several points in the story that I can't fathom myself. I can only tell you what I myself know. Uh, one question before you begin. Yes? Are we to assume that you and your brother are the sons of Major John Sholto, late of the Indian Army? Yes, that's quite right. My father retired some 11 years ago and came to live at Pondicherry Lodge in Upper Norwood. He'd done well in India and brought back with him a great deal of money, a lot of valuable curiosities, and a staff of native servants. Bartholomew and I were the only children... We lived in great luxury. You were living with your father, then, when Captain Morstan disappeared? Oh, yes. Yes, I remember it well. We read the details in the papers and discussed it freely with father. He, he used to join in our speculations about it. We never for a moment suspected that he was the one man who knew what had really happened. I see. We did realize, of course, that some mystery, some danger overhung our father. How did you know that? Because he was fearful of going out alone. He had two prize fighters to act as porters at Pondicherry Lodge. Williams, who drove you tonight, was one of them. He was once lightweight champion of England. So that's it. I thought I knew the fellow's face. But do you know what it was your father feared, Mr. Sholto? No. He would never tell us. All we knew was that he had a marked aversion to men with wooden legs. Wooden legs? Yes. And on, on, on one occasion, he actually fired a revolver at a wooden-legged man who proved to be a harmless tradesman canvassing for orders. <laughs> <laughs> we had to pay a large sum of money to hush the matter up. You never discovered any reason for your father's peculiar aversion to men with wooden legs? Well, we used to think it was a mere whim, but uh, events made us change our opinion. Oh? Yes. Early in 1882, my father received a letter from India. It was a great shock to him. He nearly fainted at the breakfast table when he opened it. And from that day, he sickened to his death. What was in the letter? Uh, we never discovered. All I could see was that it was short and written in a scrawling hand. My father had suffered for years from increasing ill health. And now he became rapidly worse. And towards the end of April, we were told that he was beyond all hope. Bartholomew and I were summoned to his bedside. He was propped up with pillows and breathing heavily. He made us lock the door, and then we came to either side of the bed, and he grasped our hands. My sons, there is one thing weighing on my mind. It is my treatment of poor Morstan's orphan. Half the treasure should have been hers. I have kept it from her. That is... Yes, Father? You see that chaplet? By the quinine bottle? Yes. Hand it to me. See, it is tipped with pearls, large, rare pearls. This at least I, I got out to send her, but my avarice stood in the way. You, my sons, will give her a fair share of the Agra treasure, but send her nothing, not even the chaplet, until I am gone... <coughs> <coughs> for a little while my father could not continue but then he gathered strength and began to speak of Captain Morstan it seems that for years the captain had suffered from a weak heart but he had concealed it from everyone only my father knew it they had worked very closely in India and through a remarkable chain of circumstances they had come into possession of a considerable treasure 
My father brought it over to England, and when Captain Morstan arrived, he went straight over to Pondicherry Lodge to claim his share. What happened that night, we learned from my dying father as we sat at his bedside. <coughs> we could not agree how to divide the treasure. There was a quarrel. We came to heated words. Morstan sprang from his chair in a paroxysm of anger. Then he turned a sickly color, pressed his hand to his side, and fell backwards, cutting his head against the corner of the treasure chest. I stooped. <coughs> I stooped over him and... and yes, sir. I saw that he was dead. For a long time, I sat there. I couldn't call for help. But why not, Father? You didn't kill him. It looked black enough against me, don't you see? An inquiry would have meant revealing the treasure. Austin had told me that no one on earth knew where he had gone. Why should anyone ever know? Then my faithful old servant, Lal Chada, helped me to dispose of the body that night. Oh, but it wasn't just that I concealed the body, I concealed the treasure too. My sons, I wish you to make restitution. Come closer. The treasure is hidden in... No! No! Keep him out! For mercy's sake, keep him out! Keep him out! My father was staring at the window. We both swung round to it. There was a face looking in out of the darkness. A bearded, hairy face with wild, cruel eyes. We rushed to the window. But the man was gone. We turned back to my father... His head had dropped, and his pulse had ceased to beat. That is the story, Miss Morstan, of how your father died, and mine. Did you search the garden for this intruder, Mr. Sholto? Indeed we did, but we found nothing except for a single footmark in the flower bed. A single footmark? Yes, but for this, we might have thought our imaginations had conjured up that wild face... However, we soon had further proof that secret agencies were at work around us. In what way? In the morning, we found the windows of my father's room open. His cupboards and boxes had been rifled, and across his chest was a torn piece of paper with the words, The Sign of the Four, scrawled on it. Ah! And can you tell us what those words mean? No. We never knew, my brother and I, and we never learned any more about the secret intruder. Had anything been stolen? Nothing as far as we could judge, though everything had been turned out. Mr. Shorter, you mentioned that the only trace left by the intruder was a single footmark. Yes. You also spoke earlier of your father's curious aversion to one-legged men. I am suggesting that your most unusual visitor on this occasion was such a man. A man with a wooden leg? Uh, yes, that is possible, I suppose. Naturally, we associated the incident in some way with the fear that haunted my father, but... Well, one-legged man or no, it still remains a complete mystery to us. Oh, forgive me. I have let my hookah go out. I must relight it. Miss Morstan, all this must be very painful for you. Is there anything I can do? A glass of water? No. No, thank you, Doctor. Oh, it's almost a relief to know the truth at last. What do you think, Holmes? All I can say as yet is that Miss Morstan is to be thanked for presenting us with such an interesting problem. Now, gentlemen. Mr. Sholto, I take it that you and your brother searched for the treasure? Oh, indeed we did. For weeks and months we dug and delved in every part of the garden, but without success. It was maddening to think that the hiding place was on his lips at the very moment he died. So all you had was this chaplet with the pearls on it? Yes, and over that, my brother Bartholomew and I had some little discussion. The pearls were obviously of great value. And between ourselves, my brother was himself a little inclined to my father's fault. He wanted to keep them? Yes. He argued that if we gave the chaplet away, it might lead to trouble. 
All I could do was to persuade him to let me find Miss Molston's address and to send her a pearl at fixed intervals so that at least she need never feel destitute. That was a very kindly thought, Mr. Sholto. Oh, my dear lady, we were your trustees. That was the view I took of it. But your brother didn't see it in that light. No, no, I'm afraid he didn't. Our difference of opinion on the subject went so far that I thought it best to leave Pondicherry Lodge and set up rooms for myself. And as, as you see... Then may I ask why, after all these years, you suddenly decided to get in touch with Miss Morstan today? Because the treasure has been discovered. Discovered? Good. It yes. hasn't. Yes, indeed. And it only remains for us to drive to Norwood and demand our share. Does your brother know we're coming? Uh, oh, yes, yes. I explained my views to him last night. We shall be expected, if not welcome, visitors. <laughs> Mr. Salter, you have done well from first to last. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. We may be able to make you some small return by throwing light on things that are still dark to you. Ah, but as Miss Morstan has said, it's getting late, and we'd best put the matter through without delay. Uh, quite so. I will prepare myself for the journey. I, I must take care to wrap up carefully. My health is somewhat fragile. Our new acquaintance coiled up the tube of his hookah and then produced from behind a curtain a very long, befrogged top coat with astrakhan collar and cuffs. This he buttoned tightly up and finished his attire by putting on a rabbit-skin cap with hanging lappets that covered his ears, so that no part of him was visible except his peaky and mobile face. Our cab was awaiting us outside, and our driver started off at once at a rapid pace. You haven't told us how the treasure was discovered, Mr. Salter. Ah, Bartholomew was a clever fellow. He'd come to the conclusion that the treasure must be somewhere indoors, so he made measurements all over the house in order that not one inch should be unaccounted for. Really? Quite a man of method. Oh, yes. And among other things, he found that the height of the building was 74 feet. But when he added together the heights of all the separate rooms and allowed for the space in between, he couldn't bring the total to more than 70 feet. Yes, but wait a minute. How could he calculate the space between the floors? By borings, presumably. That's right, he made borings. Hmm. Oh, yes, I see. I'm well, sorry to interrupt. But do go on. There were four feet unaccounted for. Well, these could only be at the top of the building. So he knocked a hole through the ceiling of the top floor room, which he used as his study, and there, sure enough, was a little garret which nobody knew about, and in the centre of it stood the treasure chest. He lowered it through the hole, and there it lies. Have you any idea of the worth of the treasure, Mr. Sholto? My brother computes the value of the jewels at not less than half a million sterling. Good. Half a million? No. Don't you realise what that means, Miss Marston? If we can secure your rights, you will be the richest heiress in England. I'm sure we congratulate you, Miss Morstan. Uh, don't we, Doctor? Uh, yes, yes, of course. <laughs> My sincere congratulations. For the rest of that journey, I sat downcast. It was the place of a loyal friend to rejoice at the news, but I'm ashamed to say that selfishness took me by the soul. An heiress... It was time for me to stop chasing will-o'-the-wisps and come back to reality. My heart was heavy as lead. And it was a relief to me when I realized that our journey was at its end. Here we are, Miss Molston. This is Pondicherry Lodge. May I give you a hand? Thank you. What do you make the time, Watson? Mm, nearly eleven. Well, at least we've left mm. the city fog uh, behind us. Williams... Hand me one of the side lamps from the carriage. Yes, sir. Thank you. As you see, my friend, Pondicherry Lodge stands in its own grounds. This high wall runs right round, and there's broken glass on top of it. The only way in is through this iron door. Who's there? It's I, McMurdo. Surely you know my knock by now. Yes. Can't you see it is? Who are the others? I had no orders about them from the master. No, McMurdo. You surprise me. I told my brother last night that I should be bringing some friends. He's no been out of his room the day, Mr. Thaddeus, and I have no orders. Now, look here. I... I can let you in, but as for your friends, they must just bide where they are. Oh, this is too bad. Surely, if I, if I guarantee them, that's enough. Very sorry, Mr. Thaddeus. 
Folk may be friends of yours and yet no friends of the master's. He pays me well to do my duty, and my duty I'll do. Listen. I, I... don't know your friends. Oh, yes, you do, McMurdo. Well? I don't think you could have forgotten me. Don't you remember the amateur who fought three rounds with you at Allison's rooms on the night of your benefit four oh. years back? Not Mr. Sherlock Holmes. None other. My oh, certes. Who could have mistaken you? If instead of standing so there so quiet, you'd just stepped up and given me yon cross hit of yours <laughs> under the jaw, ah, I'd have known you without question. Ah, you're one that has wasted your gifts. You might have aimed high if you'd joined the fancy. Ah, you see, Watson, if all else fails me, I still have one of the scientific professions open to me. Our friend won't keep us out in the cold now, I'm sure. Then ye come, sir, you and your friends. Uh, very sorry, Mr. Thaddeus, but orders are very strict. I had to be certain of your friends before I let them in. Uh, mind the wee step, miss, as you come through the door. Inside, a gravel path wound through desolate grounds to the house, which was plunged in shadow. Save where a moonbeam struck one corner and glimmered in a garret window. The vast size of the building, with its gloom and its deathless silence, struck a chill to the heart. Even for dear Sholto seemed ill at ease. I can't understand it. I distinctly told Bartholomew we were coming, and yet there's no light in his window. I, I don't know what to make of it. Does he always guard the premises like this? Yes, he has followed my father's custom. He was the favourite son, you know. I sometimes think my father may have told him more than he ever told me. Which is his window? Up there, where the moonshine strikes. But I don't think there's any light inside. No. But I see a glint of light in that little window beside the door. Ah, that's the housekeeper's room. That's where old Mrs. Bernstone sits. She'll be able to tell us all about it. Let's go to her, then. No, I, I think it would be better if you waited here for a minute or two. She may not have heard about our coming, and if we all go in together, she might be alarmed. Listen, what's that? What is it, Doctor? It's a woman's voice. She sounds afraid. It must be Mrs. Bernstone. She's the only woman in the house. Uh, wait, wait here. I'll be back in a moment. Oh, oh Mr. Bendis, I'm so glad you've come. I've been worried out of my mind. But what's the matter? Oh, please come in, sir. I can't tell you how glad I am to see you. Oh, come in. <laughs> Our guide had left us the lantern. Holmes swung it slowly round, peering at the house and the great rubbish heaps which cumbered the grounds. Miss Morstan and I stood together, and her hand was in mine. We had never seen each other before that day, yet now our hands instinctively sought for each other. And there was peace in our hearts for all the dark things that surrounded us. Oh, what a strange place. Mm, it is indeed. It looks as though all the moles in England had been let loose in the grounds. I've seen something of the sort on the site of a hill near Ballarat where the prospectors had been at work. And for the same reason, my dear Watson, these are the traces of the treasure seekers. Of course, they were six years looking for it. Exactly. No wonder the place looks like a gravel pit. Hmm? Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. What's the matter, ma'am? There's, there's something amiss. I, I'm frightened. My nerves can't stand Pull it. Pull yourself together and tell us what's happened. Mrs. Bernstone says Bartholomew has locked himself in his room and won't answer her. She's been waiting to hear from him all day. Hasn't she been up to it? Yes, yes. She went up an hour ago and looked through the keyhole. Well? She won't tell me what she saw. She says I must go and look for myself. Won't you please come with me? I simply don't feel equal to going up there alone. <laughs> Whatever she saw, it must be terrible. Come into the house at once. Miss Morstan, it might be better if you stayed with Mrs. Bernstone. Yes, Mr. You Mr. might be able to comfort the poor lady. Come, Watson. Sherlock Holmes took the lamp and led the way. Leaving Miss Morstan with the frightened housekeeper, we went up the stairs. Twice as we ascended, Holmes whipped his lens out of his pocket and carefully examined what appeared to me to be merely shapeless smudges of dust on the coconut matting that served as a stair carpet. The third flight of stairs ended in a long, straight passage, with a great picture in Indian tapestry on the right of it, and three doors on the left. At the third door, we stopped. This is my brother's study. 
Very well, then. You see? There's something amiss. I know there is. Quiet, please. Locked, as the housekeeper said. And bolted, too, I fancy. Mrs. Bernstone said she could see through the keyhole. But if it's locked... The key must have been turned far enough to leave a gap. Let's have a look. devilish in this. Look for yourself and see what you make of it. Yeah. Mm. Merciful for heaven. What have you seen? What have you seen? It's the same face. Your face. Well, of course, he's my twin. I told you, but what has happened? What is it, Holmes? That horrible smile, that fixed, unnatural grin. Is, is it a trick of the moonlight? I fancy not. Holmes, this is terrible. What's to be done? The door must come down. <coughs> <coughs> Come on, Watson, help me. We've got to get in there. All right. As I thought, he's been dead for hours. Sitting there, twisted and smiling. Holmes. Hmm? His muscles are as stiff as a board. This isn't just ordinary ragamortis. mortis. It, it's something more. Ah, a weapon on the table here. A stick with a stone head lashed to it like a hammer, and there's a piece of paper with something written. Hold the lantern close. <gasps> Read it, Watson. The sign of the fall. In God's name, what does it all mean? It means murder. Ah, I expected this. See, there, in the skin just above his ear... Mm, it looks like a long, dark thorn. It is a thorn. You can pick it out, but be careful. It's poisoned. Well, it comes away easily enough. Look, there's only the tiniest speck of blood. Even so, it's done its work. Holmes, this is fantastic. The thing grows darker instead of clear. On the contrary, it clears every instant. Mr. Holmes, hmm? the treasure... It's gone. What? Gone? They've robbed him of the treasure. You're sure it was here? There, in the ceiling, is the hole through which we lowered it. I helped him do it myself. I left him with it last night, and I heard him lock the doors. I came downstairs. I was positively the last person here. Oh. Oh, you, you don't think I did it, do you? I didn't. I swear I didn't. Mr. Shalto, you were not the last person here. How can you say that? Look there on the floor by the table. Huh? Do you see it? A small circular disc of mud? Well, what does that tell us? That's not a footmark. No, but it's something much more valuable to us. The impression of a wooden stump. You think... I think, Mr. Sholto, he's been here again. He? Who? The wooden-legged man. In the second episode of The Sign of Four by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the part of Sherlock Holmes was played by Richard Handel, Dr. Watson by Brian Coleman, Mary Morstan by Barbara Mitchell, and Thaddeus Sholto by John Moffat. The story is adapted for broadcasting by Felix Felton and produced by Archie Campbell for the BBC.